Welcome to the Buker and Friends podcast. Here is your host. Let's send it over to Rick Buker. Rick Buker. Welcome to another episode of Buker and Friends, part of the United WeCast Network. I'm Rick Buker. You can see me on FS1, you can read me on Bleacher Report, and you can follow me on Twitter at Rick Buker. All right, as promised, this is a conversation that I had with Lakers guard Rajan Rondo a couple of weeks ago now for a piece that I wrote for Bleacher Report. We got into just about everything, the Lakers and everything that transpired this past season, as well as his series of one-year deals after spending the first eight and a half seasons with the Boston Celtics, and just in general, his view of the game and how he prepares. Some of you said that you could listen to Rajon Rondo talk about basketball all day. I'm with you. I could too. And because of that, I thought that I would share this conversation. Excuse whatever ambient noise there might be. We had this conversation at a Manhattan Beach cafe. I didn't originally plan for it to be a podcast, but the conversation was so good and I couldn't get all of it into the uh, story for Bleacher Report. So with no further ado, here's Rajan. You ever go down to the beach? No, oh, sir. Uh, I walk it. Uh, look, I, I have a couple of beach bikes, so I ride on the beach all the time and kind of relax. I'll probably go go today. You ever surf? Never surf. But I was supposed to take uh, lessons this summer. That's still a possibility. Uh, so uh, avocado, lettuce, my chef, she she surfs a lot, so she told me she would teach me. But let me know, bro. Uh, you surf? I just surfed with my brother. Uh, my brother, my uh, son, yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, everybody here, like I said, they every morning they get up and they walk. Dude, they I walk was, as we were driving down, yeah. I'm checking them in. I'm checking like every spot. I'm seeing who's there. Yeah. You can surf or not. It was yeah. No, that's, cool. My whole uh, my whole family does. We we uh, we've done a couple getaways where it's just me and the kids and especially with my son just yeah. like we were out probably a couple weeks ago we went to one spot and we were there and it was just the two of us on that spot and he got two of the longest waves really? of his life and I could see you could you could have seen his smile from like outer space when he was paddling back out yeah. man hey, there's, nothing, there's nothing better than that so Duff tells me since you, you had your son he tells me you it feels like you're a changed guy like that's had an in, in, uh, maybe the, I don't know if it's your son or whether he just he just said I really want you to do this story because I feel like Rajan's a different guy and I didn't know what that meant and he and, and, he and I haven't talked about it because I wanted to see if I could get, get with you first before I did it okay. um, you feel that? you feel different? you feel like something's uh, changed? no this is, I mean I'm just getting older yeah. I mean 33 uh, you know obviously priorities and things that matter most are a different factor in my life now so yeah. uh, I, like I said I have an 11 year old daughter my son's 7 so just like I said you know, as you get older you mature and you look at life differently different perspectives so how do, how do you think parenthood has changed you? well it's not about you anymore uh, you know <laughs> I can be pretty selfish at times and you know growing up you know you fighting you know not saying fighting the household but you know competing you know, yeah. brother Younger sister, middle child, uh, you know, mother spoiled, spoiled me to death. You know, so now it's not about me anymore. Yeah. You know, it's, anything I do is not about me. It's always you know for them, with the mindset of thinking for them first and. Yeah. You know, how I you know, perceive in life or my actions and you know my legacy is pretty much going to hold to, to their truth and how people view them unfortunately but that's just how life works yeah how is the um, legacy basketball wise how do you feel about where you're at um, I never really thought about it you know to be honest like I said I tell people all the time like I, I didn't have basketball dreams growing up I didn't think I would be NBA player until I was about maybe or even have any dreams or aspirations to be and become NBA players when I was like 17, 16, 17. So. Really? Yeah, I didn't. I played, just, you know, because it was something to do. So I played because it was something to do. Like I said, the neighborhood kids, but my first love was football. You know, I thought I'd be a pro football player. Yeah. What? Wide receiver? Quarterback. 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 Yeah, so. Uh, I kind of narrowed it down, obviously, in high school and, and went to basketball. But like I guess I never thought I'd be where I'm today. So as far as legacy and you know the basketball world, like 
it, it doesn't make a difference. Like I said, I just want to go out there and continue to do what I do best and try to lead and become, you know, be a dominant player on the court every time I step out there. So legacy, it'll it take care of itself. But I'm not a big believer in what, you know, what people view me or how people view me when they say I mean, it's just the people that love me is in my inner circle, know who I am, and that's the best thing I can do you know, as far as just doing that for my legacy. There seems to be a real divide. Like people, people feel strongly about you one way or the other, right? Those who are with you, those who believe in you, those who have experienced you, like, he's my guy. Right. And then there's a whole other side that's like, he's a maniac or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, did you see the, the piece that ESPN did on the Lakers? Did you hear about it? Baxter Holmes? Yes, yes. What did you think of it? Interesting. I remember that story. The story he told about Rob? Yeah. Or the whole, the whole thing. The whole thing. But the one about... I mean, Rob telling the story about Kobe, Kobe and yeah. Keith Ledger. Yeah. What did you think when you heard it? I mean, I didn't. I didn't think too much of it. Obviously, I thought it was the truth. No. Um, you know, cause obviously, Rob and Kobe, you know, their relationship right. years go way, way back. So there's no reason not to. Believe it, right? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Not not to believe it. No reason at all. So you know, it, it, the truth came out. I guess eventually it always does. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable, but it's just it's part of the game. I think you know, it's just, it's just what it is. Just, it's, it's a surprise, but at the same time, it's it's not. Yeah. Was it as chaotic as it sounds like it was? With the Lakers, the organization, yeah, uh, it was crazy. I mean, obviously, the big, you know, the biggest market, media market, you know, what you're going to come into the season with LeBron James on the team. So, it was to me, it wasn't as crazy. It was the way things ended. Maybe with how Magic exited, you know, as far as the president doing it that way. Yeah, you know, things happen. You know, you learn and. I mean, you just go through it and see. Now there's, you know, pretty much no surprise going forward or the positions I want to be in when I get, you know, to that position for as GM or president, you know, yeah. things won't be such a much of a shock, but... Um, is, that a, um, is that an ambition of yours? Yes, absolutely. So it wasn't crazy being in it. You know, we kind of, it's kind of crazy. We got closer towards the end of the season versus the beginning. Like the team, the chemistry, the camaraderie, the guys started to, you know, really come out of their shell and come with one another, you know, start to hang out a little bit more on the road. Like, so ideally, if, hope, you know, I'll take blame and maybe not developing the chemistry as much as early, but, you know, Guys' personalities are so different. Six guys on one-year deals. You know, you don't know how much people are willing to invest or open up because people don't want to, you know, mess up or get into certain labels. So people kind of tend to stay, stay in the shell, and that's just kind of what happened this year for us as far as the chemistry, as far as developing early. And obviously, with injuries as well, that takes a that takes a toll in part as well. So you are knows eye opening. It was a learning experience. And, you know, something I put in the back of my you know, back in my arsenal as far as how to handle certain situations when I go for it. What do, you, what do you think you, what's the big takeaway from you, for you that you learned that you would say, hey, you know what, next time I'm in this situation, I might do this rather than this because I saw how this play the Lakers. Um, I was, I'm a big guy in chemistry and, but I kind of try to let it develop, you know, organically and not as much, so much force. So, you know, nowadays it's, it's, it's so new. Everybody's so phone dominant. You know, people don't really understand how to have a real conversation and talk out problems. Or man, you do sound like a dad. <laughs> you <don't> understand. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just different. It's, like I said, when I came in, it was completely different how the game has changed. But that's just what it is, and that's just the mindset of the, you know the new generation now. So you have to adapt, or you know, you can get left behind. So I would just try to. Go forward. I would try to maybe try to get the chemistry to develop a little bit earlier, quicker. But like I said, I, I was injured 60 games, so it's kind of hard. I was still trying to be at practice every day and be vocal and, and help guys. But it's, it's different from being a coach and a player. It's different from being a hurt player and a player versus a player and a player. You know, does that make sense as far as being out there every day in a fight with them versus coming trying to do film, but you're not really playing. So it's like I can easily judge everyone else, and people may not be as receptive. Like, oh, you, you know, you could. You just sound like a coach now. You're not playing. You don't understand. Like, but so it depends on the respect factor. A lot of guys.
guys have respected me in the last couple of heats I've been on, so that's you know very humbling and that helps as far as me being the vocal guy and trying to get guys to be on one accord. But it starts with me showing how genuine I am and trying to dedicate and being true to the game and true to understanding and we all have one mindset and try to win. So, yeah. But it's hard, like I said, when you have six guys on a one-year deal for guys to you know invest and give their all versus not knowing you know what the, the, the future holds. No. Who taught you the most about leadership? Taught me the most about leadership? Yeah. Say a combination of it's not really just one guy. I would say maybe Doc obviously had a lot to do with him. Doc, um, Kevin Garnett, you know, he did it with his play and versus just talking and then when Things didn't go well in years in Boston, or things were a problem. Kevin was one of the first guys to call me and tell me, you know, that, you was, that was right today or that was wrong today. So, you know, and he, the biggest thing he taught me was that you can't pick and choose when you want to be a leader. You know, you have to do it every day. So, early years in Boston, it would be, you know, some days I would come in and be great, some days I wouldn't. So, understanding that 21 years old, 22 years old, that, you know, you, you have to do it consistently. And that's one of the hardest things to do in life is to be consistent, let alone be a consistent leader at, at 23, 24 years old. So, Why do you think you struggled with consistency then? Um, it's just dynamite, by the way. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Struggled early, but I just still learning. You know, like I said, how many 22-year-old leaders can say they're leaders in this league, especially with three Hall of Famers on the team. So me trying to find my voice or I'm going to say proving my worth because obviously, you know, Kevin kind of vetoed, I didn't say vetoed the trade, but Kevin wanted me there in Boston that year in particular. So I understood the guys appreciated what I brought to the game, but still trying to find that voice, being the point guard on the floor, the extension of the coach with three Hall of Famers, future Hall of Famers. So uh, I was very secure in, in understanding what I brought to the team and just trying to, like I said, do what coach asked of me along with me developing as you know, a young player trying to you know, show my work and what I brought to the team. This is what I really don't understand. I, kind of, I, I mentioned this to you when we first talked about wanting to do something. But I look at the impact that you had, actually overall, the impact that you had overall. And the only time that I that I'm conscious of that there was a bump in the road or there was things really didn't work was in Dallas. Dallas. Right. Four months, yeah. And, you know, I know Rick really well. And I respect him. I respect him a lot. But I know that he can be challenged. And in fact, in some ways, I kind of see you guys as a little bit alike. Very what? High, very high basketball IQ. Rick is Rick. Uh, you know, I want to be Rick. What a <laughs> yeah. But I think that he has a very clear view of what needs to happen in a certain situation. And I think you do too. I think if there was any, like, not having an opportunity, like hitting the ground running mm -hmm. and having two guys who haven't had a chance to kind of sit down and talk about how they see the game and or they see a particular team and how it works, that's where I could see it would rub because you're coming in instantly recognizing, okay, I think this is what we need to do or this is what I need to do. Well, when I came in, I was I was actually trying to like just, yeah. as I always do, like early, whatever team I go to, I, I'll just sit back and let things kind of unfold, you know. You say you want this person, this, this leader, this, you know, this point guard that you don't have to you know, run the offense and, you know, kind of just let it, let it fold and I can take control. Which you knew coming in, that's what I was capable of doing, and that's what I've done, and that's what I'm accustomed to. Right. So I tried to come in, I tried to come in, and like I said, didn't say a word. Everyone kept trying to tell me to be like J. Kidd, be like J. Kidd. That's all I kept hearing. Was, Do what J. Kidd did. I was like, I'm not J. Kidd, but I understand the, the mentality of what you're all trying to give me. To, what to do you mean by that? I mean, they said J. Kidd pretty much trying to control a lot of things, yeah. you know, as far as like the pace and yeah. offensive flow. So I didn't, me coming in midseason, that couldn't be my master because I need to sit back and understand what Rick wants from me as a point guard. You know, and understand the personnel, Tyson getting used to Monte, Chandler Parsons needs the ball, Dirk where he likes his spot. So that wasn't a challenge, it was just a matter of time to, you know, to figure it out. You know, I was coming in midseason, like I said, I broke down film. Um, expectations were high. I, 
plan on winning the championship that year. Pretty much every team I go on, I feel like I can win the championship. Maybe besides the Sacramento year. But every team I've been on going into the season or, you know, wherever I was at, I feel like that we would have had a possibility if we all believed and things worked out. Obviously injury prone and a little bit of luck. Those teams I played for have probably had a, a, a small window of trying to, you know, see the big picture as far as I range. Hmm. So I never come in with the mindset like, you know, this is my shit or I'm running it or it's like, let me see back because you all, first of all, you already, I feel like a lot of people are intimidated when I do come into a, a system or a, a situation organization because of what they've heard versus actually knowing me. So I get so many people like, oh, you know, like I'm so surprised or like it's unreal how I really, I'm like, you don't, you judge me off of articles and what you perceive me from TV, how to portray me versus understanding who I really am and what my daily routine and how I work at it. So once people see that, it's like, oh, he's not that. Well, and that's where you say that's when the people on one side of the fence is like, oh, he's this, this, and the other side is the people that, you know, don't really know me or what they perceive me from the media. I would think now at this point, though, that you've demonstrated that in enough places, especially with young guys. You yeah. did in Chicago, you did in Sac, and you did it in L.A., right? New I mean, Orleans. New Orleans. I mean, the effect you've had, not just blowing the smoke, has been profound. Those teams were not, like you right. elevated those teams. And, and and it wasn't you elevated them by, you know, like forcing guys. Like you brought them along. The way guys talk about you that have played with you, this is the part that I really don't understand is like, you know, somebody said to me, well, it's your age is the reason that nobody's invested in you at this point. And I'm like, you guys are getting four year deals at 33. <laughs> They, you know, they blame my age. Like, no, nah, I don't believe that's the case. It's not. It's not my age. What do you think it is? Because I, I, I think it's probably. The, I would maybe say, I don't. You know, I don't really understand it, and that's that's okay. I'm okay with that. But it's funny, like coming into the exit meetings, and it's like I've heard this before. It's like the same. It's like they all. I want to say they all because I don't play for every team. But you know, some some guys seem like this, like a a GM. Yeah. Like exit peak pitch. That this is like the, the layout. This is the standard. Uh, you know things you should say when you're exiting me. Right. You compliment on this, this, this. Right. You don't really you know get to the nitty gritty, but you know you we love you and good luck next year. Like, versus like you know like people tell me I'm, how important I am to certain teams and what I bring to the team, but it's like yeah. okay, but you're not gonna bring me back. So like it's, it's okay to you know to be straightforward. I it's like I'm okay with it. Well, figuring out what what I can do to be better, but. It's really not that much. It's kind of pretty much the same, like, it's been the same speech coming out of these exit meetings. And, you know, when July 1st comes, things, things change. But I don't, I don't have a clue what it could be. Like the impact I thought I had in New Orleans. And I think what I, what's undervalued now is the, the chemistry and keeping guys together, keeping teams together. People think you can just put a team together one year and expect success or, you know, just make the playoffs with just one year roster we put together. But if you don't, like I was saying, this is like, if you don't, if the organization doesn't give a guy a couple year, multi year deal, then it's how much can that guy really invest in? You know, it's like a coach on a one year deal. Yeah, right. It's like like when T. Lou turned on this, like you don't really believe in me. Like you're trying to just right. fill a void, or right. you just, I'm just a plug in. Just, right. oops, but as the value as a player and as the team chemistry deals, you can't really invest. I mean, you can say that okay, you're playing for your contract or your one year deal, but it's like though on, on the mediocre teams, okay, cool, but if you're on championship caliber teams and you want to get to that level, it's not going to happen overnight. You know, a lot of people get messed up when they thought you know you put the big three together and you won. It's like that's, that was the maturity level of those guys, the sacrifices they made. It was a unique situation. And there's not a lot of I can't name four superstars or three superstars who are willing to do that and really be okay with the sacrifice and then understanding like I'm not all I can be unless he's all he can be. Right. Versus oh he's getting more attention than me. He's getting more shots. Right. It was none of that. And nowadays you can't. You can't genuinely say that you can put a team together and then and have that type of organic feeling and, and want to you know, win as a team collectively and, and do it a day by day. You had a lot of battles with LeBron when you were in Boston, right? What did you learn about him playing with him? I mean, you, you, you hear it, but his work ethic. 
you know, he, the way he goes about it, and how disciplined he is, his regimen, his routine. I mean, it's no coincidence he's been injury prone or injury free his whole career. Yeah. He invests in himself. Um, I mean, obviously, after people know he's non confrontational. Um, but, you know, he, he's consistent. But, man, he's, you know, he's, he's a hell of a player. How much was the chemistry at the end of the year? Well, let me start coming in, playing with a guy that big. How how was it for you trying to figure out where you fit or how you could lead? It wasn't. I mean, like I played, I played, I played with the most Hall of Famers in the last ten years, like as far as anybody in the league. I mean, yeah. From AD to Cuz to Kevin to Ray, I mean, you name it, Dirk. I played with anybody, yeah. and everybody from yeah. the squad. So, yeah. I mean, obviously none of them are LeBron, but I played with over ten Hall of Famers. Um, so I, I come in as you know, as a professional and and as a leader and as a, a guy that has a couple of accolades and just try to go about it as professionally and understanding like I'm here to help you. You know, I'm here to make your job a lot easier, whether it's off the court or on the court. You know, you can I'm a guy you can lean on and depend on as far as a, a steady veteran in the locker room and then as far as it's the bridge gap between you know, himself and the younger players versus you know, they don't have the bridge from him and the coaches. He does a direct line with those guys, but it's just you know, just trying to do what I can to help him. You know, yeah. be a sidekick. What I've done my whole career, take things off of the, the superstars, and what I pride myself on is making their, their job a lot easier. Yeah. You know, whether it's you know getting them, you know, four more extra points that they wouldn't have to work for as far as them just running the floor or you know finding their certain spots they love the ball in and play calling, whatever, any way I can help. You know, the superstars or a guy like LeBron. You know, that's what you have gotta come in and understand. That's, that's your role. Mo said to me oh Wagner yeah it's like your guy mm -hmm. is that one of your guys yeah he texted me the other day he talked about how you were able to bridge the gap I, again it's just kind of your influence on the young guys in particular he was a reflection of that um, has always been so powerful why what is it what, why do you think why do you think guys gravitate towards you or, or probably because they used to watch me when they were about eight or nine years old <laughs> <laughs> my son's age. They're, I was their favorite player in the son's age. So <laughs> coming in and me not being an asshole to them, I think it probably helps. But no, uh, <laughs> just the genuineness. You know, I think the, the authentic, authentic, authentication as far as, you know, me daily coming in, working out, to see how, how the work I put in. I do it by, by example. I'm pretty much the first and last to leave type of thing and willing to help break down film. I talk to a lot of young guys as far as developing it. And I always let those guys know, like, anything I can help, you know, you just call me, what is... Because a lot of things I've been there, so if you're a rookie and you, you know, you're tired of eating McDonald's or you're tired of eating out all the time, I have a chef. I always invite guys to come to the house and eat whenever they want. Um, rides to the airport. I mean, anything you name it as far as getting around the facility, uh, on the road, suggestions, food, try to take them shopping every once in a while, get them clothes. So kind of what people did for me, like what KG did for me, uh, you know, what my veterans, Keon Doolin, P.J. Brown, those guys, is, you know, instilled in me. Is just, I try to give it back. You know, I think that's what the league is missing is great vets that are willing to show the young guys the ropes and how to become professionals and how to navigate through life. And what was big for me is KG wasn't a big brother on the court. He was also one off the court. So, you know, like I said, transitioning in life from, from college to making millions of dollars to living on your own, it's like it's a big change. So me, 14, 13 years in, it's like anything you need, I, I could probably try to steer you in the right direction. If I don't know it, I'll figure it out. But I've been around a little bit and I kind of know, you know what to do, what not to do. And I let it come organic. I don't try to force myself on, the, on the, you know, certain players. I think the chemistry on the plane, you know, the road trips, people just kind of see, you know, I guess the genuineness. You know, I, I always pick up tabs whenever I go places, you know, unless I'm with LeBron. And, uh, unless you're with LeBron. Or, you know, like I think, then, what? then you're like, I mean, I, I try, I try to sneak a couple deals from him as well this year, but but he usually he's he's, he's quick that way, or or you just like no no he's, 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 he'll grab it quickly. So I I, I, I beat him a couple times getting a bit of check, but and that's like that's what KG did. You know, KG never let me pay for a bill growing up. I mean, well not growing up, but when I first came in the league, and Doc. Whenever you met Doc at a restaurant, he would pay for the the meal if you were out at the same restaurant as him. So it's kind of like I've, that's been instilled in me, and it's kind of like it's just what it is. Like, 
Yeah. Right where it's like, this is Was it? I, I've often said this about uh, LeBron and that he's almost trapped by his stardom and the expectation. Yeah. And I wonder if you see that too, whether it's with the team or with it's, it was the whole thing about Rich Paul and being on the team and clutch and or being on the team playing, right, right. being around and influencing things. Do you, do you see that? Did you, did you feel that this year? Did you sense that? I mean, I did, but like I said, coming into it, that's, that's what comes to it. I mean, it comes with it. And obviously, I was. I had no idea. Like, I've called people, you know, talked to people who played with LeBron, you know, but you don't know until you go into it, you know, yourself. So, to me, like I said, me being 14, 13 years in, it didn't, I don't think it affected me or I didn't look at it as maybe Cools did or, you know, how how Lonzo viewed it, obviously, because they've never y'all knew this. So for me, uh, yeah, you know, Mr. Basketball is, is, is it comes with it. You know, no surprise. Uh, you know, he's, he's a great teammate. You know, he's, he's very thoughtful. He's, he's a gift giver. You know, he he wants to you know, host it and have people have a good time. Kind of like myself. Like that's why I pride myself on love. We love dinners. You know, we always kind of went to dinner and. Just you know, had a drink of wine, glass of wine, and just kind of chopped it up. It was life, basketball, trying to teach the young guys, you know, a couple things to, to take note from what we've experienced. So, um, I don't know, you know, people probably don't say much about his, 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 uh, his leadership or him being a great teammate, but he's definitely, I definitely consider him a really good teammate. Do you, do you think that the, the, all the trade rumors really fucked up the young guys as much as people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, even some of the old guys. Really? Yeah. What, I mean, like Lance? I mean, I can't say name, but okay. he did. I mean, I remember we were... Um, <laughs> We were on the, oh, well, I was on the bench. Me and the guy were on the bench. The Atlanta game right before the break. Okay. And obviously all this happened. And the guy was like cussing, he was cussing the, the kind of, the, he was talking bad about the situation like during the game. I'm just like, like snap out of it. Like that shit's over it or, you know, it's, we'll go through it. But yeah. he was a vet. Like we have to continue to move forward and, yeah. you know, not focus on what the young guys may be focusing on because yeah. we have to lead back yeah. down. So yeah. that was kind of crazy to see the vet like kind of distraught from that. And me, I kind of, I'm going to say I'm kind of numb to it. Like I was in trade rooms every year in Boston. Eight straight years. So it's like you, you have to go through it and it's, you can't really kind of relate it to you for yourself. You know, being a young player, being feeling like you want it or not want it from an organization, you know, not knowing the future, waking up every day. And nowadays you're on the phone every day reading stuff. When I was going through a lot of it, it wasn't so much social media, it was just TV. Yeah. yeah. Same trade on TV or trade You probably turn that off. Yeah, I never really watched it. So it's kind of, you would hear it and, you know, people would text you and say something about it, but like not so much in your face. Eight different blockbuster trades or proposal trades, your names, and every one of them, every Instagram scroll you put, you're in it. So, psychologically, that probably took a toll on a lot of young guys. Yeah. And like myself, a lot of them probably wouldn't tell you that. You know, a lot of them probably would, would stay to a shell and say it didn't affect me. But overall, as far as the team dynamics, it, it definitely did. How did you, how did you try to use your experience or try to keep them, keep it from impacting them? I mean. Can you do anything? Is it? It's There's only so much you can say versus, yeah. like I said, daily waking up to it. And it was obviously we were in the news for a while as far as you know those names and the trades, who was going to be there, who wasn't. So guys may feel like oh, I need to prove myself to, so I won't be traded, or guys like you know they're going to trade me anyway. So it's like each game you didn't know what the mentality was for those guys individually coming out, you know, willing, to, you know, giving their all to play. Like, should I give my all to this organization who's about to trade me in two days? But my teammate doesn't want me. You know, it's all type of questions circling and looping. And it just wasn't, I don't think it was handled the right way. Would you, would you play here again? How did, how did your, how did your exit, how did your exit? Oh man, I thought, I, I thought I would get a four year deal out of the exit. <laughs> 
it went well. I mean, obviously the next day my coach <laughs> left. I mean, yeah, right. so it's like how much? Yeah, uh, like yeah. Magic left the, the first day. And what did you think of that when you saw that? What did you think? It was crazy because I, I was actually pulling into the uh, the ramp the tunnel and Rob was putting his jacket on and he kind of gave me a look like he didn't know what was going on. And I kind of asked him, I was like, "You talking to me?" He had to talk to him. I kept walking, and that's when every you know all the media was in the, in the hallway, and I saw it. And, we kind of walked in. We talked about it a little bit as players and team, but we kind of tried to. I had to focus a little bit on. Sure. It, but it was so much of a distraction that day, you couldn't really focus. And, but like I said, it was just eye opening. Like, oh, okay, this is not, not normal, but this, this is what it is. This is what we're dealing with. Was this the craziest of, of the of all the places you play? Was this the was this the craziest? Crazy. Yeah. It obviously had the most media attention. Yeah. Craziest. I mean, just in terms of, it, 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 again, see, I don't know, like, some of the things that were in the Baxter Holmes piece, I'm like, okay, you dramatized it a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of shit that goes on, right? right. It's just part of the business, right. and it's part of every business. But then there's other things where you go, God, who, and I still, I have this feeling right now, and I know Jeannie, I've known Rob, I've had, like, I know everybody, and I'm like, okay, who's really running the ship here? Like, right? Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. And so to work in that environment, like I've been in one or two places where you wonder, okay, who's really making the decisions here? Or the, the staff, like daily, being there daily, like from the trainer staff to, you know, like I guess the guys' weight room to nutrition and shit, like everybody, we were all kind of, I wouldn't say we were super tight, but we were pretty close. You know, we all spoke, we, we got along, we were together daily, that's what it had to be. You know, we traveled together, all the PR staff, and everyone was great. So we understood what we were doing. The storm we were kind of in, but at the same time, like when we were in, we were there. We were kind of just there, like we were focused on what we had to do, trying to next game. Guys getting injured, hurt. So it was, it was really genuine during all the storm, and not knowing, you know, who, you know, if you want to be there during the trade time or not. But we kind of, I think we held together as, as best as possible. I don't want to keep making excuses, but obviously injuries play a big part. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. So we'd be sitting here, maybe a different story would be written today if you know LeBron didn't go down, you know, that time. But things happen for a reason. Um, you know, obviously the trade, the Zubac trade, that, that during the deadline of, you know, I guess, just having to pull the trigger, you know, that you know, that took a toll on a couple of people. Um, you know, with Beasley went through, you know, smell, pneumonia, like it was, it was a lot of things that people were in and out. You know, we couldn't try to get the chemistry to go as quick as possible when you have one year, a lot of one-year guys. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's a big difference from seeing, like, when I was in Boston, when they when they brought the team together one year, how much, like I said, we were, KG was 30, I was 21, you know, it wasn't like we were, you know, we would go home and do the same things, you know, so the chemistry we developed, you know, as far as taking the trip to Rome, that helped, you know, like I said, the, all the dinners we used to take, we were on the road, it was kind of, it just happened naturally, and that's the time we invested, you know, we didn't have any injuries that year, so all those little things was a factor, and I think why we were successful and understanding one another, being around each other more. But the time we were apart, you know, I'm, LeBron misses, you know, 20 every games. He's not traveling. I don't travel. Javel's sick. He doesn't travel. Like, those times away where you're not with the team daily in a one-year deal, that's, those play a part. You, know, you can't really come together as quickly as you want. See, but that's what I wonder, too, is when they brought when they brought those guys together in Boston, when they built that team, you guys all knew what it was about. You were playing for a championship. Coming into this year, it was all about... I was playing for a championship coming into this year. I mean, you I have a guy on your team that went to the finals nine straight times. So, me, it was crazy. Because sitting home, watching back when he was in Cleveland, Golden State, I was at home watching the finals with my kids. And I was like, if I get LeBron on my team, if I don't win, I fail. Because he's been in the finals nine straight times. So, for me, as a coach player, I have to figure out how to beat Golden State. I was trying to figure out how to beat, get over the hump with Golden State. So, I'm kind of I'm strategically thinking before the season started, okay, I can match, you know, him up with Cuz. I can throw two people at Cuz. I'll put LeBron on, you know, such and such. I, you know, so I was already planning on how to beat the, the Golden State Warriors. Then, you know, things happen. And regardless of my roster, LeBron James on your team, for me, my expectation was the finals. Yeah. Nine straight times, I don't want to be the guy that yeah. doesn't be able to get it there. But, like I said, injuries are different, and I felt like no one could beat us four times before we beat them four times coming into the season. You miss LeBron James. You, gotta, you can't yeah. not say you're not going to be for a championship with him on your team. So, so, 
fans when you guys beat the snot out of them on Christmas Day? I know it's only one game, but you have to feel like yeah, we feel what like you envisioned was was a possibility. Absolutely. And, and at that time, like the, the energy, the synergy around the team was, you know, obviously when it helps, but like that was a, a big momentum game for us. Even the Boston game was a big momentum game for us, but obviously the trade happened and switched the starting lineup the very next game. So it was kind of obviously rocky, but that was the, the Christmas game was a big game, but we all kind of was like, you know, shit, what about LeBron? Like, that was when it went down. So we go back to the locker room, and as far as everybody else stepping up, that was big, and I think those situations are needed at times because yeah. you can't, LeBron can't wear by himself, and you need the team chemistry, you need guys to step up in big times, and that was a, it wasn't the playoffs, but it was you know, the biggest game of some guys' career, Christmas game, I wanted to defend the champs, and guys stepped up. So that, that, that gave me hope as far as, okay, I can trust this guy, you know, in the fourth quarter, I can depend on him or show LeBron, this is another guy you can trust, or this is a guy you may love to be in the pick and roll with because, you know, how he played against the champs and their defense schemes are unreal versus every team you got the other team you play. All right, that does it for part one of my conversation with Rajan Rondo. We'll bring you part two next week on the usual Wednesday, Buker and Friends day. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. By the way, if you're enjoying the podcast overall, please rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And then if you'll let us do something for you, screenshot the review and send it to at Buker Friends and you'll be eligible to win some prizes. All right, that does it for this episode. Next episode, I will be joined by Ryan Hollins. Actually, one of two things. Since we're in between games here with the uh, NBA Finals, if it's possible to bring you part two of Rondo in our next podcast, we will do that. Not sure if I could pull that off with my TV and other duties, but if we can do it, we will. Otherwise, it'll be Ryan Hollins and I Uh, breaking down everything when it comes to Kevin Durant, his future, his decision to play. Whenever we get to that, that's going to be a fiery conversation, no doubt. In the meantime, as always, thanks for listening.